Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Irene Ambrose is the co-founder of Nucleus Cyber, an AI-driven security company. She brings more than 20 years of cybersecurity experience and expertise with a special emphasis on the increasing prevalence of internal breaches within the cybersecurity sphere. We're going, to, we're going to talk today about all of this and more in hopes of making your workplace safer from threats both outside and within. Irene Ambrose is co-founder and VP at Nucleus Cyber. She's responsible for defining the company's messaging, branding, demand generation, and public relations strategies. An innovative ex executive with impeccable attention to detail, Morose leverages a, more than 20 years of B2B marketing experience to direct the company's marketing strategy and communication programs. Morose has built her successful career by empowering startups and public software companies to exceed growth objectives through successful demand generation programs, product positioning, high profile events, and product evangelism. Most recently, Morose was the Vice President of Marketing at InfoSight, a malware and threat hunting solution. She served as the SVP of Marketing for CryptZone's Network and Application Security Solutions and the VP of Hardware for High Software, a provider of compliance and security solutions acquired by CryptZone. She led the integration of the two global market organizations while managing development of all strategic marketing programs and communications for the joint entity. Her previous roles include senior marketing positions at Bottomline Technologies and CreateForm International. Morose holds a Bachelor of Science in Mass Communications from Boston University's College of Communications. Irina, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Chris. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so to start from the beginning, um, how and when did you first get started and interested in computers and security? Um, well, it's kind of funny. I, I did not have... Um, a start in the computer field. I was armed with a mass a degree in mass communication during a okay. really bad economy. Yep. Uh, and I started out in the marketing department of a large wine and spirits wholesaler. And mm. I sort of stumbled into computers a few years later. Okay. Yeah. What was, what was the impetus? Yeah. So, you know, it was just time for a change and I ended up taking a job with a, actually a software startup. Um, and to my surprise found that uh, I was very technically minded and really mm. enjoyed it. And here I am 20 years later. Okay, what were um can you give me some some of the highlights and the big transitions of of specifically your security career? Uh like what are some of the steps you took in terms of say a job experience like that or leaps of learning or or you know uh whether, you know, schooling or self-study or whatever. Like how did you sort of get from there to here as this, you know, security evangelist? Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, obviously it's a huge challenge to be able mm -hmm. to trans a transition over from a completely different industry. I had to learn about both the software and the security landscape, mm -hmm. um, and then all the technical terms and jargon that go with it with absolutely zero background. Um, you know, an important thing is you really need to get over the fear of admitting that you don't know something or understand it and, and learn it's okay to say, you know, what's that? Um, people are usually surprisingly happy to explain a technical term or a concept you're not familiar with. Yep. Um, you know, and then you do need to do a lot of research on your own, you know, after meetings, looking, looking things up and, and a lot of self-education. Um, I've also worked in, in lots of areas of software and cybersecurity. You know, every company has a different piece of the puzzle that it solves and it's mm -hmm. impossible to know everything. So um, these skills have been really helpful um, and, and being able to adapt quickly to new situations and new technologies. Okay. What, what, uh, what would you say in general is, is sort of your learning style? It sounds like you're, you're kind of a go off and study it yourself. Do you do, you know, have you, have you gone through schooling or gotten degrees or things like that? Or do you, are you mostly sort of like, I need to get this thing done by Monday. So I, I learned. Yeah, no, I think on, in the software and security world, definitely self-educated. Um, okay. I've been in this industry for a really long time. Um, mm -hmm. So you learn a lot as you go. Yeah. Um, so could you tell our listeners a little bit about what your day-to-day -day work schedule looks like? Like what time do you start work? What types of things are on your to-do list? And, and, you know, I always ask how long before, you know, the emergencies to be handled basically <laughs> set your to-do list on fire each day. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. So I've spent my software career in startups. Um, so every day looks a lot different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I can start at 8 a.m. and I wouldn't say I have an official end time. Lots of times you'll find me at my computer um, late into the night for calls with the West Coast or Australia. Oh, sure. um, and, you know, when you 
when you're in a startup, you really wear a lot of hats in a small company. So, um, you know, despite what your job description may be, you know, you'll talk a lot of different things. So one day may be about product, another day might be about an event, another day may be focused on business development. But to be honest, more often than not, um, it's a combination of all of those things each day. Yeah. Um, and to answer the other half of your question on like, you know, how do you, how do you keep track and keep organized? Um, don't laugh, but I'm very much a pen and paper list maker, despite yeah. all the digital tools available and being in the industry. Um, Everything you know, like, to do with your sort of personal learning preference, I think. I, I don't think, you know, every time you get someone say, well, you got to use this or you got to use this, like, what's the thing that actually like gets, gets results? Yeah. You know, like I said, I'm a list maker, you know, you, mm -hmm. you make your list, you work through it and then yeah. you reprioritize, um, yep. as the fires start burning, there's like a huge satisfaction on being able to look at that and cross it off. And certainly for day to day, you know, big on, um, you know, social collaboration tools internally to be able to communicate um, and escalate things and prioritize. So, you know, on that concept, very modern, but I'm still that pen and paper kind of list person. Oh yeah, there's there's no better feeling in the world than whoosh, across the across the, the the piece with a with a pencil putting a line Absolutely. through the, the two list. Um, so uh, you you say you've you you've been in, involved with the cybersecurity industry for the past twenty years. How have you seen? Uh, the cybersecurity industry change in these past 20 years, whether procedurally or technically or, you know, just in, in general, how it, how it feels or the atmosphere or what have you. What are yeah, some you know, the industry keeps evolving, you know, just mm -hmm. as the threats have, right. As it, 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 we're always kind of trying to keep pace. Um, you know, it used to be all about the perimeter, build your castle walls, build them taller, build them mm -hmm. higher, add a moat around your network um, and keep, intruders out. You know, unfortunately, we found that that's no longer effective. You know, hackers have found a way to get through security or they go after your authorized users and steal their credentials so they can navigate within your network. Um, it's not that you don't need to protect the perimeter anymore. It's just no mm -hmm. longer enough. Um, hmm. You know, you really need a multi-layered approach. So, yes. you know, now there's the, you know, identity solutions and behavior solutions, you know, to see what, what your users are doing. Um, but a lot of those solutions kind of take care of things after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not protecting the data itself. And that, at the end of the day, right, is the real target, target excuse me, of both mm -hmm. hackers and any malicious insiders. Yeah. So what, what, what are your suggestions for sort of protecting data that's not currently being addressed in these ways? Yeah. So, um, you know, if you need, first of all, you need to know where that data is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's you know, very important. Um, but you also need to start looking to some of, you know, the data loss and prevention solutions and, and more modern data centric approaches that actually focus on the data and put the permissions and controls around the data. Um, I think that is, you know, something that's really important in this day and age um, in general. Okay. Um, so one of the things that you specifically brought up as, as an interest um, and a, you know, area of expertise and so forth that we want to talk about today is uh, the difference of internal versus external threats in cybersecurity. So tell me more about uh, the insider threat landscape at the moment. You had a report from uh, July 25th of this year that indicates that insider threats have risen to new all-time highs in the past 12 months. Uh, can you say why that is, why, that, why that's changing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of data out there about external hacks and, mm -hmm. and security, um, less so about insider threats. So we partnered with cybersecurity insiders to see, you know, what the state of insider threats is in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to rattle off a couple of facts here. Please. So what the report found is 70% of organizations have confirmed that they actually have seen insider attacks become more frequent. Hmm. Um, 68% feel extremely or moderately more vulnerable. 39% um, have identified cloud storage and file apps as the most vulnerable to attacks. Um, then this last point I wanted to share, 85% of organizations find it moderately difficult, too difficult to determine um, the damage of an insider attack. Hmm. I think that last point is really important. Um, it's really hard to identify if your users are doing something they're not supposed to do. Um, after all, they, they're supposed to use your data in their day-to-day -day job. So trying to go back and take a look at what they've accessed and try and determine what they've done is difficult and time consuming. Um, and it's certainly one area where that old saying of an ounce of prevention um, yeah. really applies. 
Hmm. Okay. Uh, so before we get too far into the weeds here, let's let's talk about the actual definition of what we mean by insider threats, as used by this report. When we are speaking about what you know, what what do we mean when we say that? Is that employees with bad intents? Is this third parties who have privileged access to networks and data? Is it some combination of this? Is it other things? Yeah, well, that's a great question. It's really a combination of all those things. So okay. um, your malicious insiders are your your employees, your internal users who are right. looking to steal your information and use yeah. it for personal gain. So I think like credit card numbers, social security numbers, you know, where they're going to steal that data and yep. commit fraud and to put money in their pocket. Um, negligent insiders, though, are the ones you really don't think about. Those are the yeah. folks who you know, are inadvertently putting your data at risk. Um, mm. Just think about those whoops moments, like how many times have you accidentally shared an email with the wrong attachment right. or sent the wrong email to someone? We've, we've all done it, um, but that in and of itself, you know, could be a data breach depending on what information you've shared. So it's these types of scenarios, both malicious and negligent that make up insider threats. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, so why do you think that these specifically, these insider threats have been on the rise? What, you know, what is, what's changed in cybercrime to make this suddenly more appealing? Although it sounds like it's part of it is, is maybe that it's just being recognized more. Is that the case? Or is it really, is there like a specific intentional sort of rise? Yeah, no. So it's, a, it's a few things. So, okay. you know, for one, every, but one, everyone's been focused on the outsiders, right? Let's stop yeah. everyone from getting in. And, you know, up until now, when things are actually changing, there's been less focus on your, you know, trusted users, because these are the people that are within your organization that are meant to be doing the right thing. Um, so, you know, like I said, there's, you know, if you think about the Lewandowski case now, which, which is going on with, you know, Google and, and theft of, you know, Uber plans and things like that. You know, those are the people that are going after it for malicious reasons. But then think about the growth of your social collaboration tools. You've got SharePoint, you've got Teams, you've got Box, you have Slack. Yep. So they've just made it so much easier to access and share company information, both inside and outside of your organization. Um, and then add to that that you've got a mobile workforce. We're not all working in the same building, right? We're working at home in airports and cafes, mm -hmm. on our phones, on laptops. So it just makes the, the opportunities for making mistakes that much greater. Um, and most companies are addressing their data security today by locking down their security in a secure container or folder. But they're not actually controlling what a, a user can do with the data. So if you have access to it, you can pretty much do anything you want with it. You can share right. it, you can download it, you can copy it. Um, so, you know, it just makes it that much easier to steal or, you know, in, in most cases, it's just accidentally sharing sensitive information. Hmm. So it's not intentionally doing the wrong thing. It's making a mistake. Um, right. So an interesting point the data survey also found out is most companies rely on user training to prevent and address insider threats. Okay. Um, so but they're not actually using technology to control it. So there is creating a big security gap. You know, training is important, but mm -hmm. it's not going to stop something from happening, right? That's a, hey, you've done something wrong. Here's some more training. Um, this is how you should avoid it. Yeah. Um, it but it's again. not preventing anything, correct? Right, right. So uh, a lot of the things that you're sort of discussing here seem intangible almost to the point of like i'm not really sure how to sort of you know it, like you say you're you're inadvertently sending the wrong attachment or you're inadvertently sharing the wrong data with the wrong you know person so what are what are some of the primary weak points that you're seeing in terms of you know insiders being able to breach a security system and and you know how do you sort of deal with these sort of scary intangibles yeah so you know the real problem is in, in broad access to data and mm -hmm. the ease in which others can yeah. give you access, right? So, you know, you can easily get added. Think about with like social collaboration tools, how easy it is to add someone to a group or a chat thread. Sure. Um, so really we need to start putting some controls around this, right? So um, maybe you don't need to see everything. You know, the, this folder-based security where, you know, hey, if you have access to a folder, you can see everything in it. But, you know, data changes and evolves during time. Data is not static. So maybe it started out not having sensitive information that mm -hmm. could be for general consumption, but at some point it changes. Um, so really, you know, the data centric tools today, um, they provide a way to reduce someone's ability to steal, misuse, or accidentally share data okay. um, because they secure the data itself. Um, and then, then they're able to actually use attributes from the data. So what's mm. in the data, so it can look at the data 
um, and also look at the user context to determine how that right. data can be used or shared. So say, for example, right, you're sitting in your office and you're looking at financials, and that may, that's perfectly fine. You're supposed mm -hmm. to have access to them. You're within a secure setting. Right. But maybe you're traveling at the airport, and in that scenario, mm -hmm. even though under normal circumstances you should have access, we don't want you having access there. Yeah, um, I see. And this type of security can also help if someone's stolen your credentials. So like a good example is if someone that looks like you is trying to access data in the middle of the night, but their IP address is from China and it's two mm. o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. then maybe they should just block access, right? So, right. you know, this doesn't look like you or something that you would be doing. So we're just not going to let you look at this document right now. When you come in the office at nine in the morning, not a problem. So I think starting to add solutions like that that are looking at both the content and the context of the user to make okay. some decisions about what you can do to the data are really necessary to prevent this. Yeah, I noticed, uh, you know, sometimes you'll get those those weird notifications from your email where you'll you'll type the word see attached in the email and then you hit send and you haven't sent the attachment and they're like, right, did you mean to send an attachment? Is there is there a possibility for like an opposite version of that where you accidentally copy sensitive data into something and it's like, are you sure you meant to paste that to that person or whatever? Is that right? Yeah, no, and sort that's of in that, true. that area. Yeah. And so yeah, true. And, cer and certainly data, you know, some of the d solutions out there, they can actually address that. So if okay. it's sensitive content, it can make something read only and actually disable the copy and paste settings. It can add a digital watermark. So you're always going to have these, you know, someone who's, you know, grabs their phone and wants to snap a picture. But if right. you have a digital watermark that says you opened this file at this date and time and it's plastered all over the document, mm -hmm. you're going to think twice about where that goes because now you've just left your digital footprint on the document. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's, let's walk through some, some preparedness strategies to prevent these types of insider attacks. Are there, are there low or no cost strategies that companies can implement today to make themselves safer against these eventualities? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I talked about it a little earlier, you know, mm -hmm. first and foremost, know where your sensitive data is. Um, mm -hmm. There's some staggering stats out there on, on the amount of dark data. And that's a data that companies don't know exist. Mm. Um, it, it, and it's staggering. I think it's something like 60% of people say half their, or, their uh, organization's data is dark. Mm. So if you don't know that your data, where, where your data is stored, or that it exists in the first place, you can't protect it. So you need to make sure that you find all that data and have a, a solution for not just finding it, but classifying it, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's sensitive, you wanna make sure it's marked that way. And if you're using a platform like Office 365, there's built-in labeling and tagging and classification functionality. So um, it's there, use it. Um, and then you also, you know, if you can track your access to sensitive data using these tools, um, you know, make sure you're doing that so that, that you do have a, a digital footprint. Um, okay. And then, you know, of course, there's also third party solutions that are designed mm -hmm. to work with those investments to help you add more granular security if it's needed. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for organizations or companies that have to work with a lot of third party uh, vendors and suppliers, you know, and the inevitable security issues that can come with providing, you know, them privileged, you know, security information. We, I mean, we're obviously thinking about the, the target breach all the time, but you know, that yeah. happens all the time. People have, you have to give your sensitive information out to people so they can do their job, but they're not, you know, you, you don't have any vetting process otherwise. So what, what are some of the uh, recommendations for that sort of thing? Yeah. So, you know, I would say treat them as you would your internal users. Um, you know, don't assume that they have security and good practices on their end. Um, put those same controls in for access that you would on your internal users and make sure they only have access to what they need to. If you think about the target breach, right? You know, your, your HVAC vendor doesn't need broad access to all your systems, right? Mm -hmm. So lock it down what they have access to. So if their credentials are stolen, the hacker can't get in and navigate your system. Right. Um, and, you know, again, protecting the data itself. So even if somebody does get in, if the data has security on it, says so this vendor can't look at it, mm -hmm. then they're, then whoever is, whether it's them or someone impersonating them, won't be able to access it. Okay. Um, so we, we talk a lot, um, especially this year on the CyberWork podcast about stories of women in the cybersecurity field. Can you tell us about your own career journey as a woman in a predominantly male oriented industry? Have you had, uh, you know, uh, problems or things that you had to overcome or, you know, or, you know, issues that uh, needed solving? Um, 
yeah. So you know, it's funny, the two in industries that I've spent my career in um, have actually been male dominated. Mm -hmm. I've worked with some fantastic guys and some not so great. Um, sure. You know, I definitely feel like I've had to work harder to prove myself and be taken seriously, um, especially when, and especially in a startup environment, um, you may literally be the only win sitting, woman sitting around a meeting table. Right. Um, you know, I think it's also hard to find work-life balance being a mom. You know, you want to be taken seriously at work, yeah. but you still have home obligations. Mm -hmm. um, and I've certainly found that a lot of men that I work with who maybe have um, wives that are, you know, staying at home are not so understanding of the juggling act. Um, right. You know, that said, I'm lucky. I've actually worked with the same CEO at multiple companies who's mm -hmm. been very supportive and encouraging. Okay. Um, what are, uh, you've, you, I guess you, you've, you've pointed out a few of them, but what are some uh, you know, ingrained behaviors of the industry that you think are most likely to push away women who might otherwise be inclined to get involved? Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been told I'm too opinionated, not oh, opinionated yeah. mm -hmm. enough, too serious. I've been called a booth babe. Um, right. My favorite's being told I didn't smile enough after delivering a board presentation. It was yeah, literally right. the only criticism. So I think there's a lot of unfair criticism and negative attention that can come your yeah. way that I don't think a man would face. Um, so, you know, I think the only way to solve this though, is we just need to take gender out of the equation, right? Treat yeah. people with respect and we have to hold everyone to the same standards regardless of their gender. And that's right. clearly the, the only way to solve the issue. Mm -hmm. And also to what we're doing now, you know, just shine light on it. I think a lot of people hear this for the first time. They're like, oh, that can't be the case. And then they start thinking about it. Maybe it is the case. Yeah. Yeah. So just um, be more aware of your actions is probably a, a good piece of advice. Absolutely. Um, so what, what can we do in the cybersecurity field to make security careers more accessible or desirable to women? And conversely, how can we make the cybersecurity industry understand that more women in the tech, you know, tech industry ultimately makes the entire industry stronger? Yeah. Well, I think it needs to start when we're kids, right? We need mm -hmm. to let our daughters know that careers in tech are an option, you know, not just the traditional, um, you know, roles that, that have been available. And I think there's some, you know, nice progress being made. There's STEM programs and there's young coder programs for girls um, available today. And it's a great way to expose them to the field from early on um, and foster a passion that hopefully leads them down um, the career path to tech. Um, yeah. From an industry perspective, you know, I think we just need to embrace that diversity um, brings different viewpoints to the problems mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. solutions. Um, you know, we and we need to uh, embrace that. We need to look at to recruit women um, in more technical roles, not just the traditional sales and marketing roles yes. um, that have been available, right? To make the industry as a whole stronger, and then it just gives us all a broader viewpoint. Yeah. Do you have any um, thoughts or or suggestions or strategies for uh, sort of building the bench in the sense of, you know, we have, you know, you, you bring a lot of uh, women in the industry in sort of entry level roles, but it's, there's, there's a, there's that further level of resistance of sort of moving them up the sort of managerial ladder up into the C-suite and into, you know, S you know, uh, CISO roles or CEO roles and things like that. You, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a lot of, um, a lot of strategizing and a lot of, you know, time and effort. Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think there, you know, awareness has been raised to the issue. So I think that yeah. that's really, you know, important. So we're changing the mindset of the industry. And I think as people be, are more aware and more women get involved, um, you'll naturally see, you know, a climb to, to these other types of roles. Um, it's not a fast change, but you, you know, you're right. already seeing it. There's some, there's women at the helm of major companies. So there's, mm -hmm. there's no reason why the tech space shouldn't follow suit. Okay. Um, and, and so to wrap up with that, what, what tips would you give to women entering the world of security right now? What are some pitfalls you've learned to sidestep and what are some opportunities that are available now that maybe weren't when you started that you would recommend people, uh, you know, seek out? Yeah. I mean, I think you said it earlier, you know, the workplace definitely has changed dramatically, I would mm -hmm. say over the past one to two years. Um, and there's some, you know, open dialogue happening that's positive. Um, and the changes today are certainly not the same that I faced 20 years ago because right. of that. So I think the advice I'd give really applies to the tech industry and any industry. Um, you know, just remember you have a valuable contribution to make. You deserve a seat at the table. Yep. And, and don't be afraid to stand your ground. Don't, don't, don't let the guys bully you, you know. Um, awesome. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, as we're wrapping up today, thank you again for for all of your insights here. But um, tell, uh, walk me through a little bit of um, Nucleus Cyber. What are you? What are some of the projects you're working on? What you know? What do you? What services do you provide for your clients? And just tell us more about you. Yeah. So Nucleus Cyber um, is a data security company, um, mm-hmm. and they the you know, solution is focused around uh, Microsoft and collaboration tools. Um, okay. and, and the idea is to, you know, put that sec- security, you know, around the data and, and how do you collaborate securely, right? How do you embrace collaboration, but make sure that your data stays secure and is only, off, you know, shared with the right uh, folks. You know, it, it can be done. Okay. Um, and if people want to know more about Irina Moroz or Nucleus Cyber, where can they go online? Um, you can find me by na- my name, Irina Morose, on LinkedIn, um, okay. and the last name is spelled M R O Z. It's an unusual one. Um, <laughs> or you can visit nucleuscyber.com uh, to learn more about the solutions okay. um, and hear more about my viewpoint on our blog. Cool. All right, uh, Irina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's been great talking to you, and thank you all today for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video. You can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search cyberwork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher of choice. To see the current promotional offers available to listeners of this podcast, go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast. We've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, but we have a free election security training resource, uh, which you can download to use to educate your local poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats that they could face this election season. For more information about how to download your training packet, visit infosecinstitute.com forward slash IQ forward slash election dash security dash training, or click the link in the description. Thank you once again to Irina Moroz, and thank you all for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.